Am I unmuted now? Can you guys hear me? Not yet? Okay. We're working on it. It's a, it there we go. Got it now. All right. Good morning. Um, it is good uh, to see you all this morning. And we've got a bunch of uh, lively conversation out, out there. And I'm sure these people will start making their way in. Um, but it is good to be with you all. It is good to be with God's people and worship our Lord. And so we are glad that you are here. And if you're not uh, able to be here in person and you're tuning in on the live stream or later, uh, we are glad that uh, you are tuning in and that you are worshiping our Lord with us as well. The call to worship this morning comes from First Chronicles uh, 16. If you all will stand, it is a call and response. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we are so grateful for your love, your grace, your mercy, your steadfast love that you have shown toward us. Help us this morning to worship you in spirit and truth, to worship you uh, as you deserve, for you are the one true God who is worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Help us to put away distractions uh, to the best of our through your help, Holy Spirit, um, speak to our hearts and minds through the preaching of your word, and may you be pleased as we lift up songs of praise and worship to you this morning. In your name, amen. amen.
right. So I um, have a few announcements this morning. And uh, when we do announcements, uh, we encourage you guys um, uh, to consider taking advantage of some of these opportunities. Uh, these opportunities include ways to serve those outside the church, to serve those in the church, um, to grow in your knowledge of God's word. Um, and the purpose is uh, that we become more like Christ, that we show Christ's love to each other and to those outside the church. And so um, this is one of the ways we give our lives in worship and service to our God. Uh, we don't just worship on Sunday mornings. So um, one opportunity is this Tuesday uh, afternoon. Uh, we are going to be serving a meal at the Peninsula Rescue Mission. Uh, the Rescue Mission serves uh, men who are struggling with homelessness. Um, and if you are willing to serve, we've got two who are signed up who are going to be there. We could use one or two more people to help with that. There's no cooking. Uh, all the food is prepped. It's um, serving the men, uh, plating the food, taking it out, and then cleaning up afterwards. Um, and so there is a sign-up sheet right by the uh, kitchen door out in the lobby if you're interested. Um, also this week... Uh, teen night is going to be at the, the Workman's. The Workman's are sitting right here on the third row. Uh, so if you're a teenager, um, it's a lot of fun. I think they're going to be hanging out, uh, possibly playing some games, having a good time, um, maybe shooting pool. We'll see. Um, so uh, that's available. Um, the women's Bible study is still ongoing. I think they have a couple of weeks left. That's Wednesday nights at 630 uh, at the Matthews home. Uh, so women of the church, if you're interested in that, there's a, still a couple of weeks left in that. Um, the children's church uh, servant schedule is out. Uh, it is available on Realm. There's also a paper copy out there um, by the check-in computer. So please, if you are uh, signed up and serving in children's church, check those. And did, are we good? Okay. Check those dates. Make sure you're good for those dates. If any of those dates don't work, um, please reach out to someone else who's on the schedule and see if you can coordinate a swap first and then let Sarah Hobgood know. And if you can't do that, please let Sarah know and she'll help you do that. Um, all right. And if you aren't currently serving in Children's Church, we'd love for you to consider that. Um, it is always good to have more hands in there. In the past, we would have a helper in one of the classes and so you could be a helper. You don't necessarily have to teach. You could be in the nursery just playing with the very little ones. Uh, it is always good to have uh, more help there than not enough. And so um, sometimes some people want to rotate off, take a break for a quarter. And so please consider that if you're not serving in children's church already. All right. Um, if you are new to the church, first, second time, I'm not sure that I saw anyone new come in, but maybe there is. We have some welcome bags on a high top by the front door. Uh, I would encourage you to grab one of those if you haven't gotten one. And if you grab that, there is a card in there that you can fill out uh, with your information, and we'd love to follow up with you, answer any questions you may have, and you can just drop that card in the offering basket, which is just on the left as you go out the double doors. You can also drop tithes and offerings in that basket. Um, and so the church needs those um, tithes and offerings to operate and keep going. And so we're very grateful for your sacrificial giving, your cheerful giving. Um, there's also ways to give online on the realm. All right. That's all the announcements we have for this morning. If you will now join me in prayer. Um, this prayer is focused on salvation and how our God has accomplished our salvation and our thanks to him for that salvation. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, you are the one true God. You are gracious and merciful, kind, patient, slow to anger abounding in steadfast love, righteous and holy and just, worthy of all praise and honor and glory. We come to you this morning and we especially praise you for your plan and work of salvation for us, your people. We thank you so much that you chose to love us before the foundations of the world. 
that you planned to save us from our sins. That you, Lord Jesus, took on yourself humility. You came down from glory, took on human flesh. That you lived a life perfectly for us that we could not live. That you took on God's wrath for us on the cross. And that you were vindicated. That you were brought back to life. Lord Jesus, thank you for your work. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love and your work. Holy Spirit, thank you for giving us new hearts. That we could trust in this wonderful work. That we could trust in you. That we could trust in the work of Christ for our salvation. Thank you for that grace. We know that our salvation is 100% your work and all by grace, and we thank you for that. Lord, thank you for saving us, particularly nearly all of us in this room are Gentiles and not of the uh, nation and heritage of Israel. Thank you for bringing the gospel to the whole world, that we could be your people. Thank you for bringing us together in this local expression of your church. We need each other. We need the local church. Thank you, Lord, for your assurances in our salvation. Holy Spirit, thank you for being in us and working in our hearts, changing our hearts, that we would not be dominated by sin anymore, that we would have a desire for you, that we could trust in you. Thank you for your promises you have given us in your word, that special revelation so that we could know who you are, how you have saved us, and that because it is all by your work, we can be 100% confident that you are going to follow through and save us. And Lord God, we ask you to save others. We have many friends and family, co-workers, neighbors that do not know you. Lord, give us opportunities to share your gospel. Prepare the hearts of these loved ones and neighbors and co-workers to receive the gospel. Help us to overflow in the joy of our salvation so that we can't help but to talk of your greatness and your gospel and what you have done. And Lord, because of this great work you have done in us, help us to respond as we should. Holy Spirit, make us more like the Lord Jesus. Change us and transform us. Transform our minds and hearts and help us to do the good works you have set before us. Help us to finish the race set before us to persevere. And we thank you that you have given us that promise that we will persevere to the end. But help us to do it well as you have called us to. In your name, amen. amen. Um, at this time, children are dismissed to Children's Church. Their teachers will be in the lobby right out there. And as they continue their worship in their classrooms, we're going to continue our worship through song. So we'll have one more song, and then Steve is going to bring uh, a word to us. Would you stand with us as we sing? <laughs>
I think it's on now. Oh, it's on. <laughs> Last week I was preaching in another congregation and somehow the, uh, the headgear was a little different and it was got pointed out that way. <laughs> and I got about two sentences into the sermon and one of the men who knows me from previous connection called out, Steve, you need to bend that thing around. <laughs> okay. This was much easier than that. <clears throat> uh, pleasure to be with you again. And uh, the Lord willing, somewhere down the road, maybe this will happen again. Uh, this uh, Friday, five days from now, I'm scheduled for a hip replacement. And I'm grateful for that. And... Uh, and after I do that, then I'll do the heart rehab that I couldn't do. <laughs> anyway, too much information. Psalm 67 is our text this morning. Uh, I find this to be challenging, but also potentially life-changing psalm in terms of the focus that it calls us to. And uh, I want to reassure you, if in the course of looking at this, you start to feel like, oh, I just don't measure up. Um, neither do I. Uh, the things that we need to change in the way we look at life and the way we approach prayer can be pretty significant. And the Lord will help us. He really is for us, not looking to knock us down. So hear the word of God as it's found in Psalm 67. To the choir master with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power, among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase, God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Pray with me, please. As we look now, Father, at this portion of your inspired word, please open our hearts to receive good news and also the encouragement and correction that we need. In Jesus' name. Some years ago, my wife and I uh, moved to Mexico, and we uh, worked for about three years in a children's shelter there, uh, not long after I had retired. It's a very interesting experience, and it got me to thinking about the issue of foster care. Uh, you don't have much foster care, per se, in Mexico, and one of the reasons is that the government provides no help to folks who would do that kind of caring. In this particular children's shelter, it was a Christian couple, and, uh, and they got some assistance from the states, but they made enormous sacrifices themselves. Now, the question that I started pondering was, why is it that some people begin to provide foster care for needy children? And uh, the answer I arrived at is a fairly simple one. Uh, and there are basically two answers. Uh, one is that many such people really love children and just want to provide for them. The second answer is not so good because there are some people who simply do it for the money. Now the question I want us to look at this morning is similar to in that it has two answers 
and a range of possibilities in between those two, but two basic answers. Why do people seek God's blessing? And the two answers are that, uh, as with foster care, uh, there's more than one. And, uh, and sometimes, maybe more often than we realize, uh, we seek blessing because we want it. We feel better. We like what we get. We're looking for good things from God. Uh, this psalm gives a somewhat different answer from that. Even though the blessing of God is a precious thing and we do enjoy it and benefit from it and delight in it and, uh, and it's great. But why seek it? So that's, that's the first question I want to invite you to look at with me. Uh, first, what blessing did the psalmist have in mind? Um, I've got to make a distinction for you here because uh, verse 6 of this psalm is sometimes used to demonstrate that the blessing that... Uh, that God gave Israel and the blessing that he should give us as well is material. Verse 6, uh, uh, the earth has yielded its increase, God our God shall bless us. It, it sure looks like a harvest psalm, okay? And there's a certain amount of truth to that, but let me make this distinction for you. Clearly blessing, much of the blessing of the Old Testament era was physical. Why? because the nature of the kingdom of God under the old covenant era was physical. Much of the blessing we might seek in this era of the new covenant is not so much physical, but spiritual. Why? Because the nature of the kingdom of God in this era is spiritual. Otherwise, why would Jesus have said, my kingdom is not of this world, if it were my servants would fight is making the point that his kingdom at this stage is not a physical kingdom. If only the uh, governmental leaders of the 8th, 9th, 10th century had understood that, uh, we would not have been attacking Muslims to regain control of Jerusalem. <laughs> and setting up, setting the stage for conflict that has now lasted another millennium plus, okay? The Crusades, folks, were wrong. They were misguided. And, uh, and yet, even today, missionaries in many countries are battling that struggle because Christianity is viewed as an earthly kingdom that attacks Muslims tries to regain territory. Sorry, that's another subject that's on my heart, but it's not this psalm. So let's come back to Psalm 67. Um, we need to see that when this psalm speaks of blessing, the writer had several passages in mind. I want to try to open those up for us this morning so that we're on board with the writer of the psalm to understand the nature of blessing that he was thinking of and speaking of. Verse 1, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Well, where's that come from? Well, it's the high priestly blessing that's recorded in Numbers chapter 6. And I'm going to turn to that and read it for you. Although, you know, I've come to not trust myself as much as I once did. And so sometimes it's a lot safer to just turn and read it instead of start quoting and then lose my way in the middle and people don't get the point at all. Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 and following. This is how Aaron was told to bless, bless the people of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance, the same word, his face, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, 
Is verse 27, yes, there's verse 27, I see it, good. Uh, Verse 27 is crucial for understanding this high priestly blessing recorded in verses 24 to 26. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. What does that mean? Well, it means that God identifies those people as his. He puts his name upon them and they are then called by his name, the people of God, the people of Yahweh, the Lord's people. And that means that what this blessing is about is relationship between God and his people. It's a remarkable thing that's promised here or or that's declared. Name is not just a label. It speaks of God's favor and relationship, uh, favor and presence, and therefore relationship with his people. Second part of this lesson. Verses two through five, and I'm gonna read them again because I think we just need to hear them. Verses three through five. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And then verse seven, God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. You hear some repetition there? The peoples, the nations. It's uh, the concern that this goodness of God be seen by those surrounding his people. Verses two through five and seven use expressions that bring the whole world into view. Now on the basis of what Old Testament promise does the saving power of God come to be known among the nations? Like the end of Psalm 47 that we looked at three or four weeks ago when I was last with you, Psalm 67 reflects back on the book of Genesis. And it's the promise to Abraham that through him or in him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. So what the psalmist has in mind here then are two great strains of thought in scripture. The first one being the high priestly benediction from Numbers chapter six. And the second being the promise to Abraham that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. You see the breadth of what's in the background of the psalmist's thought here. All nations and a a blessing of relationship and of God's presence with his people. That then, I suggest, is a summary of the answer to the first question we're looking at. What blessing? did the psalmist have in mind? The blessing of presence, the blessing blessing of the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Second question, for what purpose did the psalmist seek blessing? That's an activity that I think most of us are familiar with. How often do we pray? How often do I pray? Just for the sake of God's name being lifted up and glorified. We know how to ask for stuff. I think we're probably pretty good at that. We ask for stuff a lot. Children learn to ask for stuff from their parents. And then they listen to their parents asking for stuff 
from God. <laughs> and we keep asking for more stuff. For what purpose did the psalmist seek blessing? The psalm gives a reason to seek blessing that is anything but self-centered or self-indulgent. The reason for the high priestly blessing reflected on in verse 1 is given in verse 2. Let your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. The psalm then has a refrain that is repeated twice. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. First of all, folks, that is, to my mind, an absolutely astounding thing to find in the Old Testament scriptures. Because so often, the impression we come away with is it's just us and them. And, and we're going to fight them to the death. But the psalmist is, is proclaiming something much more wonderful than mere victory over physical enemies. Let the peoples praise you, O God. And, and by the way, there are a few older translations that don't say peoples. They say people. So that might be read mistaken as a reference to the people of Israel. It's clearly not a reference to the people of Israel. It's the peoples, just as it speaks of the nations subsequently. What the psalmist is praying about is that multitudes of people from throughout the whole earth might worship our God. It's a remarkable in the Old Testament setting. But now as we come to the New Testament setting, we begin to recognize, oh, that really was what God intended to do. The vast majority of us here today are here because God has answered that prayer of the psalmist. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. <clears throat> Verse 4 then speaks of the result of the knowledge of God's ways. Uh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Why? For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. The word guide there is related to the idea of shepherding. He oversees and, and directs and guides and shepherds and provides and cares for the people over whom he reigns. And the psalmist desires that the nations would be glad and sing for joy for the Lord judges the peoples with equity. I have to come back to the theme very briefly here that, that there's an awful lot of mess in the world. Uh, conflict all around. People struggling. Uh, struggling financially to make ends meet but struggling in terms of the deprivations of warfare. The suffering that comes from, from uh, uh, unrighteous attacks. I'm sure many of you read about these things. I'm not going to try to detail them, but you know, I run across news about uh, uh, circumstances in South America, Central America, Africa, uh, obviously Ukraine, uh, persecution of the peoples in Myanmar. Uh, it, it's all over the world that there's such sorrow and suffering. But what a prayer this is. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy for you judge the peoples with equity. 
Verse 7 then connects confidence in blessing with the longing that the world might see the greatness of God and fear him. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth Now, I've passed over something in my notes that I want to return to now. And that is that the scriptures also tell us rather plainly that there are not so good reasons for seeking God's blessing. And there are warnings against this. Uh, for instance, Hebrews 12 speaks of Esau who sought God's blessing even with tears there was no change of heart in him. There was a self-centeredness about him that put him at odds with the very purposes of God and the people of God. James 4 speaks of those who ask and do not receive because they ask wrongly in order to spend it on their own passions, James 4 I bring this up, folks, because there's a great danger in asking for God's blessing for the wrong reasons. Uh, God warns against it. What we have here in Psalm 67 is maybe the most magnificent reason you could find in all of Scripture for seeking God's blessing. It's so that others might see how spectacular it is to know the living God, to live under his good hand. That doesn't mean all problems go away, you know. It doesn't mean that suddenly life is so swimmingly easy that no wonder everybody would want to be like us. It's because they look at how we're dealing with the life that we're in the midst of, and we're still trusting God. We know he's going to care for us. He blesses us with the knowledge of himself and his own nearness, with the certainty that he's working for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I'm in one of those situations, you know, where I've signed the papers again. You remember the papers that a surgeon has you sign before you are put to sleep. And one of the warnings of those papers is, this is usually very successful surgery, you know, but not always. Sometimes, every once in a while, someone doesn't come out of this. I'm here to tell you today, folks, that in spite of my enormous weakness, the Lord assures me that all is good. All will come together. And if I come through the surgery and recover, then he'll have good things for me. And if I do not, then he'll take me home to be with himself. That's okay. And so you can pray for me, but pray for my wife and family. If that happens, that the peoples might praise him when they see that, dear friends, is our ultimate purpose in this life. We are called to be a people set apart to give praise to the one living and true God. And we fail in a lot of that, to be sure. And I'm going to come in a minute to something enormously encouraging 
if you're feeling a bit beaten up because you don't pray for the right reason all the time. But God's call to us is to put the worship of himself above all. So that the way we live will be an invitation to others to worship our God. He's worthy. He's that great. So may God help us to recognize when our longings for his good gifts have more to do with our own comfort, wealth, success, prestige, or pleasure than they have to do with his glory. Because the theme song of our hearts ought to be, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The psalm directs us to a conclusion also besides that. Clearly, the goal of our prayers as of the psalmist's prayer should be to seek God's blessing in order that he might be glorified. But take comfort, friends. The burden isn't on you because there's one who's all Absolutely perfectly. Verse 1 points us to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It not only points us back to number 6, but forward to 2 Corinthians 4, where, where we read that God, who said, Let light shine in darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There's the shining face who reflects the glory of God. Why? Because he let go of his own blessedness. He left behind the glory of heaven. He bore the curse in our place to reconcile us to God. He now lives, having been raised from the dead and ascended to heaven. He now lives to make intercession for us. In him is not only all glory for all eternity, all blessing, but also now the power to put God's glory to long that the peoples, all the peoples, praise him. So you, you might even say that ultimately the call of the psalm and of this sermon is for us to simply seek the power of the Lord Jesus at work through the Holy Spirit so that we might be more like him in choosing not our own blessedness for our own sake, but God's blessing so that his name might be lifted up. We desperately need that help, friends. So don't go away from here today feeling like, oh, I just can't do it. Because the answer is, no, you can't. But Christ can in you. Many years ago now, an older pastor who at the time was I think a year or so younger than I am now, so that makes me an older pastor, <laughs> told me the story of someone, it's a wonderful story, Pastor Harry Grimes uh, filled in as a supply preacher in the last church that I served before I got there. The pulpit was uh, 
they, they had no pastor at the time, and, and Harry stepped in three Sundays a month. He was there, month after month after month, preaching. He told me this story. At one point in his career, he had served in a setting where um, there were a lot of working class people, blue collar people, who would walk from where they worked. And Harry would sit on his front porch, just greeting people as they went by. And oftentimes, after a period of time, he developed relationships. And people would come and ask him to pray for them. Well, there were two ladies who came one, one uh, afternoon, leaving their shift, and started telling him this long, difficult story uh, and asking him to pray. And Harry raised some questions and was trying to understand the situation better. And after a fair amount of give and take, here's what he realized. The lady was asking prayer for a character in a soap opera. Not the actor, the character. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm glad it was Harry and not me. <laughs> because, because I know he handled it very kindly. Because the reality is, we all realize, as, as you laugh in response, we realize what a silly thing to do. Now here's my point, folks. If we seek God's blessing simply for ourselves, simply for our benefit, for whatever reason related to me, myself, and I, instead of seeking his blessing so that he might be praised, isn't that even So God help us, God help us to reorient, to be less attached to the things of this life and to the pleasures of this life and to the comforts of this life and to the status of this life and more attached to the glory of God. Let the peoples praise you. So parents can head to the lobby to pick up children from Children's Church.
these last moments just to remind you, and I know you've been other servants of God and faithful ministry of the word this summer, just to remind you, Ephesians chapter 1, pray that God might grant you the knowledge of himself. Ephesians chapter 3, pray that you might know the love of Christ. Psalm 47, praise God because he is the eternal king. Psalm 67, pray for a blessing that the peoples might praise him. Now, if you would receive the benediction, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance.